Our guest is uh, for the uh, candidate for the 96, Tanner Rogers from the House of Delegates. Tanner, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. This is the first time I'm meeting you. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you first off. Pleasure to meet all y'all. Um, I've lived here in the 96th. Well, I've lived here in Martinsburg my entire life, which is almost 22 years, 22 in June. Mm -hmm. So, um, graduated from Martinsburg High in 2020, graduated from... West Virginia University in 2023, back there for my master's, finishing that up, you know, getting all that squared away. What's your master's in, Tanner? Linguistics. Okay. Which uh, actually leads me into how I got, how I decided to run for the, the office as well. Sure. As y'all are probably well aware, there's these drastic cuts going on at WVU regarding <coughs> the so-called <coughs> academic transformation. And... I'm not going to, you know, lambast President Gee for, you know, his Everybody own else has. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm talking about as a person because yeah. I've seen enough people do that and that's just not how I roll. As a decision, however, that affects the state of West Virginia, not just in the short term, but in the long term. And I was one of the people in the, uh, in the student protests. There's pictures of me in the AP and all that, but I mean, it's not like one of those big student leaders from like, you know, the, the student union or whatever they call it. Um, Dan, we've got to stop those quotation marks, dude. Yeah. All right. All right. But um, <laughs> I'm just joking with you. Listen up a little bit. Okay. All right. So then, okay, I'm very gesticular. <laughs> I will, but I'm trying to keep it on the, on the down low. I'm sorry. But um, I called originally Delegate Gino Chiarelli up in Morgantown mm -hmm. and was like, hey, you know, we talked about it for a little bit. And he was like, yeah, you should run. I'm like, yeah, I don't know, because do I want to be called a politician? No. Flat out, I do not like to be called a politician. Because what's the first thing, genuine question, what's the first thing you think of when you hear the word politician? Not normally good things, I would think. Yeah, let me let me back up. Isn't that a little bit of a hypocrisy? Uh, you're running for office, but I'm not a politician. By definition, if you run for office, you are a politician. You can't run away from that fact. That is true, but I'd like to. Uh, I'd prefer the term civil servant because, at the end of the day, well, poli regardless if it's a politician or you know anyone in government, for example, they're a servant of the people. They're a civil servant, or ideally, that's what they're supposed to do. At least, in my opinion. And so, I, so are you running specifically because of WVU's tuition cuts? Well, not only that. Cuts? Not only that, but having lived in West Virginia my entire life compared to my opponent, who's a wonderful woman, you know, personally speaking, as far as I'm concerned. She's only lived here since 2019. That's two, di two different ball games, in my opinion. But having seen what's gone on in West Virginian politics and looking into the 20-something year-long stretch and even before that, before I was even alive, <coughs> a lot of our political class seems to put forward very short-term solutions. And I understand that some of the times they mean well. However, good intentions don't exactly fix, you know, long-term pressing issues like infrastructure and, you know, infrastructural reform, educational things, you know, all these different, you know, taxation, all these different topics that one has to address, especially West Virginia's declining population. West Virginia peaked in population in, I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken here, 1950, at 2.09 million people. West Virginia's current population stands at roughly about 1.77 million, and it's stagnating. We can't necessarily rely on out-of-staters to keep moving in, even though, you know, at least in the Eastern Panhandle, they might, you know, little by little. But that's not always a good thing, and it's not always a necessarily good thing for the state, because that concentrates more than it already has the wealth in two major areas, the Eastern Panhandle and the Northern Panhandle. Then you will have, you know, Central and Southern West Virginia that are completely left out. But... <laughs> One of my big things is reversing that population decline. And how are you going to do that? 
I have actually I have it written out on my little platform. Um, what is your platform? To reverse the population decline, one must see the demographic change that's happening in West Virginia. West Virginians are not, even though we're, you know, the highest state in terms of rising fertility rates, that's not enough. We are still below, according to all international metrics of fertility rates, below replacement level for a population, which means more people are dying than they are having children. Yes. Are you going to reverse the population decline? I'm going to incentivize, much like what was done in Hungary, incentivize young families to get married and to actually not just think about marriage, get married, have children, which means we have to be able to give not just you know financial incentives, but taxation incentives. In Hungary, what was done to much success, wonderful success even, was for each of the first three children that are born, they get a cash payout. And then after the fourth child, if they have four or more children, they are exempt from taxation. However, we would have to, you know, scale that to West Virginia because Hungary is a country of roughly around nine or so million people, nine times the population of West Virginia. So, of course, you'd have to scale that, but that's a All right, well, let's, let's work on the Tanner plan here. What is the cash payout for a married couple to get married and have a child? Okay, if they have a child... I would say probably around 1,200 or so. I don't have exact numbers. I would have to talk with the financial committee on that if I'm elected because, you know, with the financial committee, they like to have their say over finances and stuff, and that's completely understandable. I mean, you can propose things all you want, but if you don't have the money to do it, that's a... All right, so is the $1,200 a one-time payment or an annual payment until the child reaches a maturity age? It would be a, as far as I'm aware, as of right now, a one-time payment. And then for each child born, that would increase in amount. Another so 1200, 1200, 1200 Maxing yeah. out at 3600 Either maxing out at 3600 or twelve, or going like 1200 1600 2000 and then... If you have four or more children, you'd be exempt from taxes. That sounds like a Democratic proposal as a Republican. But I, under, I, as Republican. I understand that. And the reason I propose it in the first place is everyone's caught up in party politics, you know, Republican, Democrat, whatever. I identify more with the Republican Party on a social platform. However, I realize that the solutions that have been put forth we need to realize that these decisions that are better towards you know big businesses and things like that aren't necessarily the best decisions in the long term regardless of party one has to look out for the people i would think and that doesn't mean you know make everyone reliant on the government per se but it means the government's duty at the end of the day is to provide services for the people which one of those services is infrastructure. One of those services is education, things like that. And we need to realize that. I mean, another thing I propose that may sound like a uh, Democratic Party platform is um, a four-day work week. But that was originally proposed by Vi then Vice President Richard Nixon in 1956. Are you proposing a four-day work week for all state employees or all private sector and state uh, sector employees? All employees, private sector and public. Do you increase the work day to 10 or 12 hours or are you keeping it eight hours? I'd say it would have to depend on a number of factors, but with this would be without loss of you know current benefits and pay because I did they actually did a study on this in um, with Microsoft Japan and you know the Japanese are very hardworking people and I have it pulled up here. A four day, the benefits of a four-day work week without reduction of pay and, in the case of Microsoft Japan, paid leave on Friday, were incredibly beneficial. Using Microsoft Japan, you know, electricity costs for the company went down by nearly 25%. Sales per employee increased by 40%. 
and production generally went up, stress went down. There was nothing lost by having a four day work week. In fact, it was much more beneficial. So are you, going, think, are you going to incentivize private employers to do this or are you going to decree that this is a 40, a four day work week and everyone must abide by it? How do you do, how do you implement that? I would believe that it would have to be negotiated because of course, you know, business is business and you're going to want to not just maximize, you know, profit, but I must say one has to look out for the little guy because working people, especially in West Virginia, where the majority of the population is of the working class, one has to look out for the worker because the worker at the end of the day is the backbone of society and people, we have families to go home to and you know, all that and we have to provide for them. And that's just something that needs to be realized by a lot of people. And that's at least integrally important. That's how societies have functioned for the past over 6,000 years. If we just throw, you know, all that to the wind, what are we going to have? We're going to have absolute chaos. Bill? Uh, yeah. Uh, one of your questions, one of your, on your, on your platform, you say, mm -hmm. West Virginia requires a comprehensive look, comma, mm -hmm. if not an outright overhaul of our education system. How would you overhaul, outright overhaul of the education system? I would look at how we are teaching our children now, regardless if it's, you know, social studies slash history, you know, mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, English, whatever the case may be. It seems that the pedagogical methods that are currently used in West Virginia schools, having gone through the West Virginia school system myself um, fairly recently, things don't work. People won't pay attention because class is boring. You give them a bunch of worksheets to do and expect them to, you know, here you go. It's on your own. And that's not, you know, diminishing the role of the teacher because they, they do, they do wonderful work. I, I was a pleasure to be an instructor in German at West Virginia university this past year. And from what I've seen, is a lot of these kids, they want to, you know, participate and they love, you know, learning. However, because it's so boring to a majority of students, they, they can't get into it. But then you have them, if you find them ways to get into it, find ways to energize them, suddenly they all start cropping up and they're like, you know, I have these wonderful ideas. And, you know, even if they require more intimate study, you know, these ideas and what they propose. And that's all well, fine and dandy. That's how education works. That's how knowledge works. It's how knowledge grows. If you have an ignorant society in terms of, you know, education level, it's very bad for the society long term because then you don't have these great advancements in technology and then, you know, the humanities and things like that that we've had for the past 200 or more years. I mean, 200 in the United States, much more across, you know, the entire history of the Western world. So, um, so Tanner, first off, I certainly congratulate you and applaud you as a young person for throwing your hat in the ring. It's, um, you know, there's a, uh, I'm sure you've encountered all kinds of things as you've been running for office. Some of your ideas sound very bold and mm -hmm. impressive. Um, you're going to come in if you're elected, um, probably about, I don't know, 30, 40 years younger than most of the other members of the, um, of mm -hmm. the House of Delegates. How do you get people to go along with some of these ideas? Because, I mean, we've heard for years in the Eastern Panhandle talks of locality pay, mm -hmm. um, you know, all kinds of things that are just really difficult to get sort of the team approach, if you will. What's yeah. your approach to do that? I mean, it's all about 
explaining to people because a lot of people you know they have especially the less politically inclined shall we say and that's not you know meaning anything you know mean or anything like that towards those type they're just not that you know interested in politics and that's completely okay however one must explain the rationale and also the benefits long term and short term across the board to everyone. Everyone should be able to hear it. That's why I have my campaign, you know, my platform bullet pointed out on the internet, you know, for everyone, anyone and everyone to be able to view. It's, I would think rather accessible. I mean, a lot of people say very, you know, vague things or make very bold campaign promises. Not that I didn't use the word promise anywhere in my thing. And that's not because, you know, oh, I'm so, like, great. But no, it's, these are proposals. These are things that I put forth and that I think, personally, looking at statistics and looking at what it would have on the effect on the state, things that would be beneficial. Now, of course, that can be dialogued between, you know, different members of the Republican Party if I'm elected and, you know, members of the House of Delegates and the Senate and the governor. But this, these are the things that I think are important. Things like the economy, things like education, things like, you know, our Second Amendment rights, things of especially, you know, the rights of the worker, things like that. Because that's all very important stuff. Tanner, on that note, uh, your time is just about up, so you've got a minute talk uh, to our audience and tell them why they should vote for you for the House of Delegates 96th. All righty. Well, in a nutshell, uh, as was said, I have very bold proposals. However, I believe that in the long-term interest of the state of West Virginia and her people, that these are in the best interest to promote, and I will fight tooth and nail for them. If you want someone who's no nonsense, you know, I'm not going to try and sell you a fake rug i'm like okay you know this is this is what i propose if you disagree with it have a conversation with me be be willing to i'd be happy to i'd be willing to explain to you why i think the way that i do but that, that we don't have a lot of that in modern politics we have a lot of flinging turds at one another to put it very crudely unfortunately but that's just how it is i haven't had my breakfast yet be careful please yes um but that's that's just how how things are unfortunately and that's something i want to change not just on the west virginia state level but what's your uh, facebook page or website or whatever other social media you're using to my, share your ideas my facebook is at uh is well rogers for house f-o-r house my twitter well now x is Rogers, R O G E R S, the number four W V. And my website is Rogers, F O R W V dot S U B S T A C K dot com, Substack dot com. Tanner, have a great day. I appreciate you coming Thank in today. Thank you. It was a wonderful pleasure. Best Thank of luck you. in the upcoming election, sir. Thank you.